This explosive action right off the market lows, that's what should get your attention because that's one of the very first stocks to get into new high ground here right off the correction lows. Right here, see it really matures, it tightens up, it meets my signature VCP. And again, look at the RS line going into new right. high ground. This is where I bought it. And then you get that leverage. All right. If you get a follow through day, you don't just buy anything. You still have to have stocks coming out of bases, nice, tight, right sides. Don't get, be afraid that, you know, oh, this is just a bear market rally. And the news is telling me that the end of the world is coming. Trust the stocks. When do you typically look to sell at least a, a portion into strength? Are you, when you're already up X percent and it's getting extended again from a moving average? It's the same thing with this. The strategy is better than you. No matter if you have a sound strategy, um, you know, it's the discipline to stick with it. So the discipline to stay the course and to believe in yourself. And I'm a junior high school dropout, started with a couple thousand dollars. And I've made tens of millions of dollars and, and, and made a great life for myself and, and have students all over the world that have done the same. So if I can do it, there's no reason why anybody else can. <laughs> all right, welcome back everybody to the Trail Line Podcast brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. Um, I'm your host, Richard Moglin, and joining us today is a fantastic guest that I'm sure every single one of you is familiar with. We have two-time U.S. investing champion Mark Minervini in the house. Uh, Mark is the founder of Minervini Private Access, as well as the Master Trader Program. He's also the author of several excellent and foundational books. They're behind me on the bookshelf right, right over there, uh, and you can see the names right here. And as I mentioned, uh, the Master Trader Program is upcoming and today we're going to kind of dive into a special presentation that uh, we've got planned here on handling market corrections, as well as identifying the new leaders coming out of them. So, uh, Mark, first of all, thanks so much for being here and looking forward to this. OK, great to be here with you, Richard. Yeah. And to kick things off, uh, just taking a step back here. Why is it so important for traders to uh, stay in tune with the market and kind of what the where where we are in the overall market cycle, whether that's uptrend, downtrend, late uptrend, you know, start a, or beginning of a correction. Why is it important to stay in tune with with what's going on? So you're saying even while you're while you're in a correction, and when when, when maybe you think you should take a vacation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the time where you really got to roll up your sleeves and do the work and find out what's holding up well, what maybe those next leading groups will be. And um, and as I'm about to show you in just a second, that's where you're going to get the potential leverage going forward. So this is when I actually spend the most time really digging in and really you know, doing a lot of screening and trying to find the stocks that uh, are some of the better uh, performers during the correction. Yeah, perfect. And I asked uh, people on Twitter what they'd most like to ask you here. And I know you pay a lot of attention to what how stocks are performing, how many setups there are, but uh, they were curious if you use any other market indicators that help inform you about the overall health, whether it's breath metrics, trend indicators, stuff like that. So uh, anything like that that you, you take a look at? So I'm always trying to gauge the participation as to how much participation there is for you know, as you mentioned, breath. Um, so that's how strong the market is, how much of an engine, you know, is beneath the surface and also, you know, where that participation is coming from. So this this is a good segue right into a few slides that if you've been following me on Twitter, you've seen I've been talking about this stuff for quite a while. Um, but if you go back to the, and, and uh, back to the correction before we had this correction, of course, I may, had a sell signal. I gave a sell signal on November I guess it was 22nd, 2021. And part of that, a large part of that was because of the divergence. Here is the uh, percentage of stocks above their 200-day moving average. And this is the NASDAQ composite. Uh, so beneath the surface, and this is something that we just saw happen just recently, where you got this big glaring divergence. And in my 40 years, I've never seen the market survive when you get this scenario without at least a correction. And that's when you get below the 50% number, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in the 30s. That's where if you get down in the 30s, where you're hitting new highs or you're, you're diverging uh, for a period of time, uh, usually you have to have a correction or if you've been going up for a long time in a bull market, you you'll usually enter into a bear market. And you can see right here as we're hitting new highs, we're well below and we're way above the 200 day moving average. And more recently, you can see we ran up here off the lows. We had a really nice run here. And then you're getting that divergence. You're below the 50% mark. And then even when you're, you're well above this level, um, 
uh, you're starting to improve and it looks like, okay, maybe, you know, we're improving here. We get above that 50%. We correct here. And now we come down into the thirties. So if this market, as it's rallying back, it gets back into new high ground, you're just going to diverge even more. So you could pretty much see that the participation is getting weaker and weaker. And now as you come back up to those levels, you see you're, you're in the thirties now. And that's what led to this pullback where now we're going to get the indexes to pull back probably near the 200 day and agree more with these stocks that are the grand majority of them are already below the 200 day moving average. Just something that I tweeted about uh, and also the 50 day moving average. I look at the 50 day moving average percentage of stocks above the 50 and the percentage above the 200 day. And while it's not a magic formula, it will tell you the participation versus the indexes. And the reason why is because of this chart right here. Right now we've got in an amazing situation where you've got just five stocks in the S and P 500, and this goes for the Nasdaq too, the mega caps, um, are are accounting for about 25 percent of the the index, uh, the market cap, and just 20 names are accounting for 42 percent of the indexes. So the, the indexes are being moved by just a very small handful. So there's not much breath there. And and quite frankly, when you get to the point where you're calling the uh the fang stocks the magnificent seven that's the new name that tells you right there that uh, all the juice is out of the lemon that you're, you're it's like the back in uh the in the 60s the 70s you had the nifty 50 um you know you had the same thing in the, in the 90s where you had the qualcomms and the dell computers and yahoo they had the same uh, situation all over again a market moving up on a smaller number of names can't sustain that we need we need to broaden out and just jumping in here with a question um do you recommend uh, traders also take a look at you know other indexes other than uh, just the S and P five hundred, like the the Russell, the IWO as well, just because that gives kind of a better picture of how small and mid caps are doing, and it's not quite as dominated by these mega caps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can look at equally weighted indexes. You know, I'm I'm looking at the four hundred. I'm looking at the Russell two thousand, the S and P four hundred, the Russell two thousand, um, and and that again. Now that gets to the, the other point where okay, we want to know the how broad the participation and then where the participation is. Right. So I mean, just looking at the IBD fifty. If you do you look at the IBD fifty, it's near its lows and the relative strength line is still hitting new lows. So that tells you that if you're that momentum growth investor, those stocks are not performing very well right now. You're getting you're, you're getting it in just these very few names that are weighting the indexes, and you're not broadening out even even in the narrow index like an IBD fifty. Uh, but if you start looking even broader and you look into the mid caps and the small caps, they're performing horribly. I, I mentioned this just recently to my members that uh, Stan Weinstein, who's a good friend of mine, and you know he's the one who turned me on to the the. The, uh, the the trend one, two, three, four uh, trend stages uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he was talking about a head and shoulders top, a little head and shoulders top forming in the Russell. And we sure enough, we broke that neckline and we've been coming off since. Yeah, perfect. And when you start to notice these type of signs uh, that, you know, the market's weakening, the leaders are breaking down a little bit, what what actions are you taking in with regards to your own trading to kind of adapt to a, a correction? Are, are you sizing down more? trying to take less trades, what are you kind of doing to, to handle that? Yeah, so this is really important because a lot of people, they think, well, you know, the market starts rolling over, so you start raising cash. Well, actually, even if the market's rolling over, I'm not raising cash unless my stocks are not performing well. Because you don't know when you're in a correction that you might be in a pullback in the market and all your stocks hold your stops. So there's no reason to sell unless you're starting to see deterioration in your own holdings, in your own watch list. So that's really what's going to Get, that's my lead indicator. Now, if I'm seeing distribution in the market and we're seeing, you know, there's been a lot of, since we topped back in July here, there's been virtually nothing but distribution days. There was like two accumulation days and right after four days later and six days after the two uh, accumulation days, we had distribution came right back. So there's no signs of accumulation. Well, now I got to look at the individual stocks and say, okay, what's going on there? And if the, I get the two, if we get stocks aren't acting right, and you're getting distribution in the market. I mean, this is just a straight O'Neill, Bill O'Neill analysis. Yeah. You're not going to get too far off track if you just stick with that. And when there, and when you're seeing accumulation, uh, you get a follow through day. You're seeing accumulation days off the lows, and stocks are starting to set up, and you're getting stocks breaking out of bases. You're going to be in a. You're going to not going to get too far, far off track being in the next uptrend. So that's really you know keeping it simple is uh you know is the best way as far as I found. Instead of getting into, I show all these indicators and stuff, but they're really secondary to the stocks themselves. Perfect. And uh, one more question. Sorry, do you, have any, okay. do you have any goals for uh, keeping your equity curve within a certain per 
percentage of of highs and and uh i know you talk a lot about the merits of selling into strength to try to keep it new highs um i know a lot of people were curious about any guidelines you have uh to to try to do that to sell into strength so th those uh those corrections don't give back you know all those gains that you've made during the uptrends so if you're selling as into strength, as the stock is hitting its highest point since you've owned it, let's say, you know, say you bought it, it goes up, you're up 10%, 15, or you're up 20% now, you sell it up 20%, you sell it into strength. Well, you're selling at the highest of the of your equity curve in that stock. So there's no volatility. There's no, there's no downside drawdown. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep stair-stepping that up, you're going to have very little volatility. Now, if you play for a much bigger move, you might have to go through some corrections and that's going to create that volatility. And, and a lot of times you'll get corrections or you'll get um, these movements will come in bunches. So you'll get a lot of stocks will move together. And now if you get yourself fully invested, you don't sell into that strength, you play for a bigger move. Well, now you might have an, a good number of your names give back a lot of your gain then you're looking back and you're saying oh boy i wish i sold i should have sold when i was up 25 percent. now i'm only up five percent some of my stocks are stopping me out so here's the here's the 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 issue the problem and here's the answer the problem is is that traders don't de define themselves as whether they're going to be a trader or they're going to be an investor or even going into a stock, whether I'm going into this name and I'm going to play it for a big move or I'm just playing it for a trade. And if you are going to just play it for a trade, then you have to realize that you're going to sacrifice the bigger move. And if you're playing it for a big move, you're going to sacrifice the shorter moves and you're going to have to give back. So there's a price to be paid on either side. But what happens is we get into this regret, you know, indecision, when the stock's up and then when it we make the decision and then it moves against us, now you regret it, you wish you did it differently. And now you're zigzagging all over the place emotionally and and, and you run into a lot of trouble because you didn't have a, a real plan and you're Monday morning quarterbacking. Yeah. And from from the perspective of a swing trader, when do you typically look to sell at least a, a portion into strength? Are you when you're already up X percent and it's getting extended again from a moving average? How how do you kind of like to handle it? So I mean I'm looking at first of all how much I risked. So and 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 this so multiples of that, yeah. Well, this gets misinterpreted though sometimes because yeah. I might go in with a really tight stop and I risk two percent. Doesn't mean I'm selling at four. It doesn't mean I'm selling at six or eight. You know, I get four times my risk. I get a four, uh, you know, four X uh, trade. I, it doesn't mean that or four R's doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to sell. Um, I'm I want to get in as low risk as possible and have the biggest gain as possible. But what I'm looking for is when that stock starts to look like the downside outweighs the upside. And that mm -hmm. takes some expertise and that takes some skill. And until you get that, you might want to stick with more of uh, 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 the type of suggestion of you know selling at a certain or selling a portion at least at a certain percentage gain. Maybe when you get up a couple times your risk, two three times your risk. If you're taking a normal risk of five six seven eight percent, now you're up 12, 15, 20 percent. You take some off the table. Now you cushion your downside. If it comes back, it stops you out. You don't lose any money, and that's a way to free roll the trade. And, and for beginners, that's a that's a better way. Later on, you get the expertise. You start seeing you know the, the warning signs and so forth. And these are the things. That we're going to go through we only have limited time i know just yeah. before we started this we, we only have a certain amount of time but we're going to go through all this in the master trader program it's five days and i don't know what it is now 35 hours and we go everything in, in you know in very much detail but that takes time to to um you know to build that that skill and that expertise to know exactly what to look for yeah perfect i'll let you go back here because th this is a great concept here that the, the the leaders are leading in the cycle as well so perfect so, okay, so again, the, the, some of these things get misinterpreted, and that's why we try to put graphics and explain it as best we can, because when you're in a correction, uh, and, and, and in particular a bear market, you're in a bear market, sometimes stocks are breaking out of bases and they're trying to emerge when you just start the bear market. The first leg down, you might have some stocks that move out, but there's just not enough. Uh, uh, you know, broad participation and they pull back and the volatility is too high and you get whipped around. But those aren't names that you should be chalking off your your list because those are the names that are trying to get into new high ground and then you watch them so there's three areas when you're when you're in a correction there's three areas that i'm watching one is what i call predictive it's be while the market's in correction and looking for the stocks that are trying to emerge the other is right off the lows when you get follow through action and you're coming off the lows what's breaking out what's coming out of bases what's emerging first what's going into new high ground off the lows and then the final is what i call confirming that's when you finally have troughed out in the market you've marked up a bit and now you've get you you start to broaden out and more stocks participate and you start to come out of bases and it becomes more obvious 
So I'll just show you how what that looks like. And I'm going to show you examples going all the way back from here. We're going to go back to 1990, all the way to current. Um, and, 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 and these are pretty much every stock I'm going to show you. Um, I bought uh, at this time, I think just one of them, one of these stocks I didn't buy. Uh, but, Amgen was a name that uh, was setting up uh, and really held up quite well during what at the time this bear market in 1990 was a really treacherous bear market. Uh, percentage wise, I think it was maybe down 25, 30 percent on the, uh, the the S&P or the Dow. But everybody was calling for the end of the world. As a matter of fact, this is where I met Stan Weinstein. I met him in October of 1990 at a conference. Um, and and uh, that was the first time we met and talked about the four stage analysis. But I had already read his book. Um, so we came off the lows here and had a follow through day. And at that time, Amgen was coming out of this base that was really just holding up while the market was well below its 200 day moving average and well below its 50. This stock didn't even go uh, uh, you know, much below the 50 day and came right back, was going into new high ground. So I bought it. I bought that stock right here. Um, and that turned out to be a big winner. It went up about 360% over the next, I, I guess, year, year and a half or so. But if you take a look here, as the market started correcting, you can see that it was trying to go into new high ground. And the volatility from the bear market was whipping it around a bit. And maybe you would have got jostled around. But finally, it, it got nice and it tightened up. And the time was right once you started coming off the lows. And this is where, this is how O'Neill would apply follow through day analysis to actually buying stocks based on a follow through day. And, and, and a simple O'Neill rule is to buy uh, something. You know, when you get a follow through day, if, 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 big, big if. If you have stocks setting up, all right, if you get a follow through day, you don't just buy anything. You still have to have stocks coming out of bases, nice, tight, right sides. And but if you do have it, don't don't get be afraid that, you know, oh, this is just a bear market rally. And the news is telling me that the end of the world is coming. Trust the stocks. Go in there and buy something. Maybe you put on 5, 10, 15, 20 percent exposure. You take a few positions. They start working. Then you can add some more right here. This is where Amgen is breaking into new high ground. I'm buying Amgen right here at where everybody at this time is calling for the end of the world. This is like the, you know, everybody's saying there's going to be a 1970s uh, style bear market. This is just a, a a brief rally here. Meanwhile, a whole bunch of stocks are breaking out of basis. I'm loading up here and and, and I had a huge year that year. And uh, before we move on, was Amgen part of a, a larger group or theme that was working at that time? And and how, how does that come into play, the, the group themes that you see? Okay, very good point. Um, so it was, it was it, a lot of medical, uh, biomedical, um, a lot of medical products. Uh, healthcare uh, stocks were were doing well then. Uh, computers, uh, this is it was the proliferation of, of the personal computer. And you had a lot of cousin uh, uh industries like for instance you had dell computer but you also had american power conversion because they made those uh, uh uninterruptible uh power supplies that went with the computers so computer peripherals software microsoft at the time but microsoft was coming out of the base at this time too and microsoft back then you might say oh yeah microsoft nope back microsoft back then was a me medium cap company that very few people knew about uh, home depot was coming out of the base here very few people knew about home depot at the time um, then there was other companies that were small, T-Square Medical, Ballard Medical Products. So yeah, there was a theme. But here's the here's the real key. The key is is that, and, and this is my own experience. In my own experience, when I first started, I used to try to form a market opinion, look for the groups, and then buy the best stocks in the groups. And I constantly missed the leaders, and I never made any money for the first six years. I turned it all around. I flipped it backwards. And I said, you know what? I'm going to let the stocks lead me because I keep missing them and they're taking off. By the time I get onto the group, they're already taken off. So I'm going to go and look for just those stocks and find the best stocks. And then when I start to see a bunch of stocks in a particular group, I'll know the group's strong. And when we get a number of groups working and stocks are working, we'll know the market's strong. And suddenly I'm calling tops and bottoms like I got a crystal ball and I'm making a bunch of money because I'm focusing on the best merchandise. Yeah, perfect. I think I think it's helpful. And any kind of guidelines or tips uh, to help people with this process if, if they're just starting out to, to try to identify those leaders and, and then bring that to the groups? Well, I mean, the the, the main uh, tip is to, you know, read good books. You should read my books and read O'Neill's books. I, you don't really have to go much further than my books and, and O'Neill's books are completely, completely homogenous. Um, and and um, 
you know, study those because 98% of everything that I do and I've done are in my books. Um, and then if you want to take it to a, an even higher level of, you know, of education, that's why we have the master trader program, but you got to study, you got to study, you've got to learn from people that have already done what you're looking to do. And, um, and the main thing is that you commit, whether it's to me, whether it's to somebody else, whether it's to a Bill Miller value strategy, commit to one style and strategy and become an expert at it. And because you're not going to be able to do everything. And you're going to have to also realize that there's going to be times where those strategies aren't going to work very well. And, and it's someone else's turn. And that's when you you, you do other uh, work, like you know your house cleaning work and do your post analysis and things like that and, and, and read and study more. Perfect. And uh, there are also some questions that people are asking about progressive exposure. Uh, could you maybe give a quick example of, you know, maybe a series of trades that would get you to scale up quickly when you see these these first trades work well? Because you've mentioned in the past that on on the downside, when corrections happen, people scale back well, but they often don't scale back up once a new uptrend begins. Yeah, that's true. Um, so this is something that myself and Mark Ritchie, who you, you of course know um, uh, well from Momentum Masters, he's works with me now for a number of years, and he actually came to the very first Master Trader program in 2010. Um, he has a very uh, um, he, he's like me. He he very quickly will be willing to move that exposure up once he sees what he needs to see, and this is where people misinterpret a progressive exposure. They think they have to slowly expose. No, yes. While while the trades aren't working, you don't want to you know you don't want to move your exposure up at all. Uh, matter of fact, you want to move it down if things aren't working. But once they start working, a few pilot buys, a few test positions, and you've got more setups. Now you very quickly start ramping that up. Um, and, and so I'll put out. I might put on you know a couple five percent positions, maybe just one twenty percent position. You know, but I'll usually my first toe in the water is usually twenty five percent of my of my total account i'll get invested somehow i'll work my way to 25 percent, whether it's four or five five percent positions or one or two positions and then if that's working i usually i usually ramp up to 50 percent pretty quickly but i'll get a little more concentrated i might add to the positions that i've already have if they're still viable or i'll add maybe instead of having four positions i'll add two and have bigger positions two 10 percent positions and if that's working i very quickly will move up to 75, 100% invest it and get very concentrated. And that, that could all can happen in a number of days, you know, in a week or two, or it might take a month to happen. Yeah, I, th I think that's super helpful because some people think you got to sell the initial positions and and, and then move on. Uh, but no, I think that's, that's great detail. And I know you've got some more examples to go through here. So let's just take a look at um, FICO because FICO is one that you set up a couple bases here and let's forget about how viable they were and whether you had great entry points or not. You do have a couple bases here and, and this stock um, has uh, just go over here off of those bases. You've marked up pretty nicely and this has really had some great alpha. There's been very little volatility. It's held to 50 day the entire time. But what you really want, what you really want to key in on is this action right here, this explosive action right off the market lows. This is the this is the 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 uh, correction lows or the bear market lows right here. And we come blasting off those lows. Let's look at a weekly. You see how you come right off the lows here and you see that relative strength line turn up. That's what should get your attention because that's one of the very first stocks to get into new high ground here right off the correction lows and then you start building out these bases and you build out another base and you get these buy these buy points that you can now uh buy from from low risk where you've now got some evidence that there's real buying in there and you've got that trend in place so and, and i'm going to show you at the end here we'll we'll go over the sort of the four or five things you should look for in during a correction but uh, just looking at them individually stocks that are moving back into new high ground the fastest the ones that get there first the ones that get there the fastest coming off the lows and sometimes they even get there before the low is even made and they pull back and make that last low the market makes a lower low and and the stock that got into new high ground makes a higher low and you start building that base. So Peloton was a perfect example. You coming off the lows, it's back in new high ground in just 18 days. After the, all this corrective activity, it just rips itself back into, into new high ground in 18 days. And this is where people talk about leverage. I don't use leverage pretty much, uh, hardly ever. Although in the US investing championship, because 
everybody's using leverage. It's kind of like when you go into a competition and you're in a competition like the U.S. Investing Championship, it's kind of like being in the NFL. You know, the the guy on the other side of the field, he's on steroids. So you got to take steroids too. So I've kind of forced to use leverage at that point to get those big returns. But I generally don't use leverage. I stopped using leverage many, many years ago. The way I get leverage is by being in the leading stocks that are going going to go up multiples of the market. So when the market gets into a new uptrend, we get into a bull market, I'm going in these stocks that not only have the ability to make a big move over a number of uh, uh, maybe years, but even sometimes just in a few weeks or a month, they go up 20, 30, 50%. And now I'm compounding very rapidly. So that's how you get that leverage by going in the best merchandise. Now you can get some of the worst merchandise could have big rallies off the lows. And and certainly you get snapback rallies that are, that are pretty big, but it, it's kind of, it's hard to predict that because they kind of come out of nowhere. You know, which low is the real low? When, when you're trend following, you've got the trend in place. You're playing a content, uh, continuation of an existing trend and it's a little bit easier to get a picture of what's going on and 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 not be blindsided so cisco was a stock that i bought uh unfortunately i did not hold this stock it went up 70 or 80 thousand percent i sold it very quickly but it it was very similar you know in some ways almost identical to the peloton only this went up way bigger than peloton uh in just 10 days after being a new issue going through a corrective process um you're in new high ground. You're in new high ground. And you can see here, you know, tremendous leverage. Look at the leverage you get on the market. And then I, I think it doubled or tripled from here as well. I mean, it's, like I said, Cisco went up all the way until we topped, I think in 2000. Uh, so it went up for 10 years and and they had 16 quarters of triple digit earnings. So you could do the math, 16 quarters of every quarter, you're doubling your earnings. You know, you start off with you know, very a, a micro uh, company, you end up with a Fortune 500 company. Uh, but, but you see right here, this is the low in the market, that little circle. I, I know it's hard to see. It's kind of compressed. But that's the low in the market. Look how Cisco is moving into new high ground right off the low. It's one of the very first stocks to because once that pressure comes off, um, you know you're 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 going you're going to take off because the only reason why the the stock is down is because the market's on. There's so much pressure and they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Show you a couple other examples. So DocuSign, and again, this is some. These are actually some slides that are from the Master Trader Program Workshop. Um, just giving you sort of a little a little sneak peek here, um, and, and we don't have the time to go through much more. Uh, back in new high ground in just ten days on DocuSign, you see it holding up pretty well as the market's below its two hundred. It comes down, hits the two hundred, and it rips right back to new high ground in just ten days. That's telling you this stock wants to go higher. And sure enough, you get that tremendous leverage. Stock goes, you know, uh, doubles or triples uh, during a time where, I don't know, the market goes up maybe 30%. So that that's how I get that's how I get the leverage. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I, I think this was making relative strength new highs well before price as well. I mean, yeah, look at that RS line just very quickly. I did it even dip almost during that correction? It barely looks like it did. It did not. Yes. And, and you know, what? that's a good point. Let's go back here and go back to Amgen. Uh, I meant to, I meant to point that out. So you see right here where we're making those, we're making those, well, actually right here. See, we're making these highs here while the market's correcting. There's the relative strength line, new high ground, relative strength line, new high ground, relative strength line, new high ground, relative strength. Now this stock doesn't have to go up for this relative strength line to go into new highs, because even if it moves sideways, the market going down, it's outperforming. So we'll go down and show you one other example here. This is my buy in Chipotle. Um, similar situation where you see the market's coming off here. The stock's just marking time. Look at the relative strength line. It's just making high after high after high after high after high. Now, here's where some people will go go wrong and and get themselves whipped around a bit and might give up on a stock uh, or, or try to get in it prematurely. So you've got the stocks in an uptrend, right? That, that you, you, you met that criteria. And maybe this is some news, you get earnings, it runs up. So now you've, you've accelerated a bit, you go into a correction and you form this base. And you're like, oh, wow, I listen to Mark Minervini, I'm going to buy the ones that go into new high ground first. This is going into new high ground right there. But sometimes what will happen is, and, it, and usually what will happen is it'll come off of a short base and then the market stays weak and you come back down and you have to spend more time. And if the market's really weak, you'll undercut the lows, you'll shake out everybody that bought it and you just need more time. It doesn't mean that you take it off your list. As long as it's holding up, it's building a base. And it was one of those stocks that was going to new high ground first, stick with it, 
stay with the watch the fundamentals, watch the stock, and then right here, see it really matures, it tightens up, it meets my signature VCP. And again, look at the RS line going into right. high ground. This is where I bought it, and then you get that leverage. And you see again, this stock goes up, it doubles in a period where the market goes up, I don't know, 15, 20%, 30%. That that that's uh that's how I've been doing it since uh, the the 1980s. And nothing has changed, and I don't foresee anything changing anytime until I'm not here anymore. <laughs> and then I'm sure my students and, and people who work with me will be doing it for the, many decades after that. Um, so real quick, let me just give you, because I know we're going to run out of time. So this is what you're going to look for off the general market low. When you're in a correction, you want to look for stocks that corrected the least amount off the highs. Um the closer to a new high, the better. But generally, I like them to be within 25% of a new high. Um, when 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 I'm looking to buy them, they may correct more than that. But when I'm when I'm going to look to buy them, I don't want to be buying stocks that are down 40, 50 percent, and that's where I'm buying them from because there's too much overhead supply. Number two, stocks that are base building; they're consolidating within an, within a long term uptrend, like Chipotle. Chipotle they had that consolidation, moving sideways. Maybe you you know maybe you tried to break out of a shorter base. As long as it stays consolidating and it meets the criteria, stick with it. Um, the, the ones that surged the most and the fastest off the lows and got to new highs the quickest, those are usually, those not, may not be viable right away because they get extended. But then you'll look for a lot of up days versus down days, what uh, um, uh, uh, David Ryan invented called ants, where you have 12 out of 15 days or greater up versus down. You look for that type of action, and then from there, a subsequent entry point. And then also IPOs, recent IPOs. I mean, right now I'm short Dix. I was buying Dix off of its first IPO base before it went up 500%. And now that that's that's long gone, and now it's uh, it's rolled over and it's a, it's a short. So, but look for those IPOs because the best time to buy IPOs is when the market's in a correction. And that's the earliest point that you're going to get a stock. So I call those magnitude plays because you're getting it as early as you can in its life cycle. And then going back to your your uh, uh, your point on incremental exposure, progressive exposure, then as you start to see trades working and these trades uh, are showing you profits, then you incrementally start adding exposure as long as the stock should be in those criteria. Yeah, perfect. And going to point number four, both the, the Cisco example and Peloton, they were both recent IPOs that went through their primary base and were exploding higher uh, coming out of corrections. So uh, 100%. Those are great examples. Yeah, yeah. Um, I got time for you know for some questions. I know you had a lot of questions. Yeah, I've asked a few, but uh, just taking a step back, um, I, I you, you wrote a whole book on mindset, so I figured this would be a great topic to bring up. Mm -hmm. um, what what mental barriers do you think prevent traders from achieving their full potential and, and becoming the traders that they can be? Well, the number one barrier is is a belief in themselves that they can do this. And, you know, things get difficult and then they start thinking, well, you know, either they think the person who's doing well got lucky or it's uh, it's rigged or they're special and I don't have what it takes, things like that. And it's going to be difficult. You know, this is a very, if, if it wasn't, everybody would be a rich stock trader. Um, there's probably a higher failure rate, you know, for, for this as a profession is for almost anything. Um, you probably easier to become a major league baseball player than a, you know, a really great stock trader, but the rewards are so enormous and the upside is so unlimited that it's worth the time. It's worth the time. And I, fortunately, for whatever reason, I saw that very early on when I was very young, I realized that there was unlimited uh, uh, upside potential here and there was no prejudice that anybody could do it. And it just meant, you know, learning, getting the skill, acquiring the skill and sticking with it. So I went six years. I didn't make any money at all. Um, I was at a loss, actually, after six years, but I stuck with it and I stayed with the same approach and mastered it because I didn't blame or use excuses and say, well, you know, the 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 the, the strategy doesn't work anymore. I have people to this day. I mean, it doesn't matter. I can make a billion dollars with my strategy and have it work 20 years in a row. And there's going to be somebody that says it doesn't work anymore because it doesn't work for them. <laughs> they don't they, they don't know. They don't know how to apply it properly. So they think it doesn't work. But um, you, it's really, you know, if you have a, a, a sound principles and, and a sound method, uh, it's it's the gun. It's not the gunner. You know, it, it, I'm sorry, it's the gunner, not the gun. It's not the gun, it's the gunner. It's The gun's not broken. You know, I go through this all the time with, uh, some of you know, I, I, I compete in shooting sports. And uh, some of you will 
come and they're new and they'll they'll start learning shooting they'll say i this must be the gun like there's no way i could be missing like that and then i take their gun and i shoot it perfect and you know if you put the gun in a vice it shoots perfectly straight only you you the gun shoots better than you it's the same thing with this the strategy is better than you no matter if you have a sound strategy um you know it's the discipline to stick with it so the discipline to stay the course and to believe in yourself and i'm a junior high school dropout started with a couple thousand dollars and i've made tens of millions of dollars and and, and made a great life for myself and and have students all over the world that have done the same so if i can do it there's no reason why anybody else can't perfect and, and just one last question here if you were speaking to yourself at 20 years old what advice would you give yourself then about trading and also about life? Well, I mean, I guess about life would be that you're probably not going to be really great at something for any if you're not passionate about it. So, but sometimes people are passionate about things and then they let the weight of the world and the weight of failure convince them that they can't do it <laughs> and they lose their passion, but they really would like to do that. So you really follow what, if you really love it and you want to do it and it's something that, you know, is, is a, is an aspirational goal of yours. Don't, don't give up on it, you know, stay with it. That's the main thing. So many people give up too easily. That's what I see. Um, and that goes, and, and I, I would think that that would be advice for life or for trading. Yeah. And, I think a common thread among the the great traders who I've gotten the chance to talk to, uh, yourself included, it's it's passion that allowed them to stick with it during those years where they're learning and and building up their skills. That's what brings them through at the end and and keeps them motivated to to succeed and ultimately find their way for sure. Quite frankly, I've tried to get away from trading a number of times. I've thought about retiring. I actually retired for a little while, and my wife would love it if I retired and. Um, and, and I, I tried to get away from it. I don't need any more money, um, but I love trading so much. I always, I always end up back, you know, trading and, and writing books and being in the business uh, because uh, it's, it's my passion. Fortunately, I've been able to make my passion work for me and be also my business and, 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 uh, and, and be fruitful. But like I said, so can anybody, but it's going to take time. You, you got to, you got to be patient with yourself and you got to give yourself time. Perfect. Well, Mark, always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, obviously, your books are on the screen. Uh, where, where can people learn more from you? And also, uh, I'd love for you to mention the Master Tra Trader Program as well, which I took back in, in 2020 with, with you and David Ryan. It was it was excellent. Yeah. So, Minervini.com, of course. All my books are on Amazon. And then, fourstocktraders.com to sign up for the Master Trader Program. Master Trader Program is five days over 30 hours of curriculum, live trading on uh, the fifth day where I usually put a, a million bucks in an account and just trade it. Hopefully we'll have some trades to make. Mark Ritchie is my co-instructor. He's an amazing trader. He's had a tremendous uh, track record uh, with only three down years in the last 14 years, five, five, and 6%. So incredible risk management. Um, he'll also be trading on live trading day um my assistant usually trades on live trading day well everybody can trade uh, uh so um we'll we'll uh, uh we'll we'll do it for the 14th year this is the 14th year of the master trader program and we have attendees from over i believe 70 some odd countries this year perfect well mark thanks again so much for your time uh to everybody watching i hope you guys found this valuable and and got some great nuggets out of this so thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, if you enjoyed please go ahead and leave a like down below uh subscribe to the channel and uh, we'll see you guys in future videos take care oh always great richard take care